take the period immediately following the bad habit execution, meaning let's say you tell yourself you're not going to pick up your phone, you're not going to bite your nails, you're not going to reflexively walk to the refrigerator at a particular time of day, but you find yourself doing it anyway. And what actually has to happen is bringing conscious awareness to the period immediately afterward, which I think most people recognize. They realize, oh, I just did it again. I just did it again. And in that moment, capture the sequence of events, not that led to the bad habit execution, but actually to take advantage of the fact that the neurons that were responsible for generating that bad habit were, were active a moment ago and to actually engage in a replacement behavior immediately afterward. Now, this is really interesting and I think powerful because I would have thought that you have to re- engage in a replacement behavior that truly replaces the bad habit behavior, right? Uh, that you would have to be able to identify your state of mind or the sequence of events leading into the bad habit, but rather the stage or the period immediately after the bad habit execution is a unique opportunity to insert a different type of what we would call adaptive behavior, but that could be any behavior that's not in line with the bad behavior. So let's give it an example. Let's say you find yourself, um, you're trying to do focused work, you pick up your phone, you're disappointing yourself for, for picking up your phone. You could, of course, just put it down or you, and re-engage in the work behavior. But if you were good at that, then you probably wouldn't have done it in the first place. And so what turns out to be very effective is to go engage in some other positive habit. Now, this has two major effects. The first one is you start to link in time the execution of a bad behavior to this other good behavior. And in doing so, you start to recruit other neural circuits other neurons that can start to somewhat dismantle the sequence of firing associated with the bad behavior. In other words, you start to create a kind of a double habit that starts with a bad habit and then ends with a good habit. And that seems to create enough of a temporal mismatch so that then recognizing when you're heading toward the bad habit becomes more apparent to you. So again, I want to make this very, very concrete. Let's say that the behavior is reflexively picking up one's phone. You do that. You think, oh, goodness, I did it again. Here's what I'm going to do. You would set that down and then you would engage in some other positive behavior that you've deemed positive. And here it's very subjective. So it's hard for me to give an example that will necessarily make sense to everybody, but perhaps um, you're working on hydration. So maybe you go have a glass of water. Maybe you um, you are trying to uh, do breath work or something. Maybe you're, you are trying to uh, enhance your language speaking skills. And so you go and you spend five minutes doing a particular type of language learning. You literally exit whatever you are doing and perform that other new positive habit in the immediate period right after that, even for a short period of time. It's a little bit counterintuitive, but what this does is it creates a kind of a cognitive and a temporal mismatch between the initial bad behavior, which before is what we would call sort of a closed loop. In uh, The engineers out there will know what I'm talking about. But in closed loop, it's sort of one behavior, one set of neural firings leads to another, leads to another, and then just kind of sets the same thing in motion. It can be kind of a self-perpetuating system. By changing the number of features that are in that loop, it disrupts the, the closed nature of that loop. It creates what we call an open loop. And in an open loop, you are better able to intervene. So as I mentioned before, this might seem counterintuitive. You might think, why would I want to reward the execution of a bad habit with a good habit? I don't want to reward myself for the bad habit, but really what you're trying to do is you're trying to change the nature of the neural circuits that are firing so that you can rewrite the script for that bad habit. A different way to put it would be, imagine that the bad habit is like a a chord on the piano that you play or a chord of notes or a sequence of notes that you would play. And it comes very easily. You can play it every single time. But let's say as you're trying to learn a new piece of music, you're just constantly inserting that at the inappropriate times. That was a, you know, I think it's a decent enough analogy for a bad habit because it involves some motor execution. You just find yourself doing it rather than trying to prevent yourself from doing it. The next time you do it, add in a new quarter sequence that you're trying to learn. What this does then is it changes the whole nature of the sequence of neurons that are firing from bad habit through to the end of this newly applied good habit. So this is the way in which you start to dismantle, or when I say dismantle, really weaken the likelihood that if neuron A fires, neuron B will fire. Because as you're starting off in the mode of very reflexively performing a bad habit, those neurons are firing together without you consciously being aware of it. It's 
almost impossible for you to intervene in yourself uh, without a number of other features like severe punishment, um, severe consequence type outcomes. Rather, tacking on some additional sequences, like if neuron A fires, neuron B fires, and then you're saying, okay, well, if neuron B fires, I'm going to start inserting neuron C, D, E, F to fire, right? That's the C, D, E, F being the positive behavior that you're going to insert. And in doing so, you create a chain of neuronal activation that then is very easy to dismantle. And so when people have applied this kind of approach, it removes the need to have constant conscious awareness of one's own behavior prior to that behavior, which is very, very difficult to achieve. Rather, what they find is that they are able to engage in remapping of the neural circuits associated with bad habits in ways that are very, very straightforward, right? Because you can always identify when you've done the thing you don't want to do and then tack on to that something additional that's positive. Now, the nature of that positive thing is important. You don't want it to be something that's very hard to execute. You want it to be something that's positive and fairly easy to execute so that you're not struggling all the time to insert this on top of this bad behavior, whatever that bad behavior might happen to be. But again, this is rooted in the biology of long-term depression. It maps very well to the behavioral change literature that I was able to glean that really shows that rather than just get reminders, rather than try and instill punishment, rather than setting up reward for breaking bad habits, that perhaps the simplest way to approach this is to tack on additional behaviors to the bad habits, make sure those behaviors are good behaviors or behaviors that are adaptive for you. And in doing so, you will soon find that the initiation of the bad habit takes on a whole new form or that you're not even inspired to do it at all.